Hey, well, since we're going to be very small, we're also going to be very interactive today. <laughs> so this is what you call personal, a personal workshop. Um, how is that? So uh, welcome, Carmen, and hopefully you'll have some others uh, join you as well. So if you don't have a notebook and pen, this is going to be an interactive workshop. And so I would recommend grabbing one of those. I'm going to recommend that you take some notes throughout um, our workshop. And um, we're also gonna be using the chat feature throughout the workshop as well. Um, and actually we may do some chat and we might just, I might, Tiffany, um, just have you turn off um, and, and make it an open communication since we are gonna be small and intimate. So, okay. all yeah, right, go ahead and, um, and get started. So um, Carmen, would love to get to know you. So um, as I feel to facilitate training, I love interaction. And, and typically I do this session in, in person versus virtual. But I would love for you, if you could, to get started, um, go ahead and chat in your, your we've got your name, but your superpower. Like what is, what is your superpower? What are you known for? And Tiffany and Elizabeth, you're more than welcome to share yours too, if you'd like. Patience. Oh, Carmen, I am so envious. Um, I wish that that was my super, um, uh, super power, because um, I need a lot of that. So I, I love to hear that. So we're going to talk a little bit about our superpower traits uh, throughout uh, the presentation as well. So a little bit about myself, Julie Weisenbach. I recently launched a new business, uh, actually th this month, and so brand new for us. IU grad, about 20 years in recruiting, entrepreneurial, I'm a mom of two teens, and you're going to hear me refer a bit back to my kids, because um, personal branding is something we talk a lot about at home. And I'm just passionate about recruiting and strategy. Um, my superpower trait um, is I'm a coach and mentor. Um, that's something that I am just absolutely absolutely love to do and I feel like a lot of times whether it's family whether it's friends I'm getting a phone call can you help me with my resume can you help me I'm looking for a job so um, I do that I do that quite a bit so what we're going to talk about today is what is a personal brand how do you create one we're also going to talk about your professional elevator pitch because that does go hand in hand um, we're going to talk about social media and the importance of, and how that kind of impacts your personal brand with social media today. And then I'll leave a couple of questions as well at the end, uh, a couple of minutes at the, at the end for some questions. You know, a saying that's actually one of my saying, favorite sayings is everything you do is branding and it's either working for you or it's working against you, but it's always working, right? And, and that is, it, whether that's an external brand or whether that's your own personal brand, it is, it is so true. So let's talk a little bit about what an external brand is. So when we think about some of these brands, Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, Target, at um, Starbucks. These are probably all brands that you're fairly familiar with. Uh, there's a lot of recognition out there. We're going to dig into this here in just a minute. Um, but, but that's more of an external consumer brand. What's a personal brand? A personal brand is your story. It's who you are. It's also how others make you feel. It's values. It's how you express yourself and it's what you stand for. So it's, it's all about you and it's how others see you, whether intentional or not. One of the reasons it's so important is it's about self-awareness. It's about how others perceive you. And we're gonna talk a lot around um, from a, an employer standpoint. So if you, whether you're applying for a job, whether you are already working for an organization, we're gonna talk about how important that is, but it also helps you to understand your strengths and know what you bring into the workplace. 
So let's talk more about brands. Again, Chick-fil-A, Disney, Target. Um, Carmen, I'll ask you, what, what brand um, resonates the most with you? Do you mean out of those that we're seeing on your screen? Yes, correct. Starbucks. Starbucks, yeah. And why does that brain resonate with you? Well, it's not because I go there. I've maybe only been there a handful of times, but I can see that um, brand icon or yeah. trademark and I know what it is, even without any words yeah. beside it. Yeah, um, and that's so true. That's the same with like McDonald's, right? And, and Target. Um, when I think about, you know, Chick-fil-A, you know, I think about the big cow. Um, you know, not eat, don't eat chicken, or um, eat chicken, not, you know, not, not cows. Um, I think of Disney and I think about your, you know, your customer service experience and that it's you know, a fun environment um, that you attend. So when we talk about, about you know, learning about brands, you know, we learn about brands from a variety of different you know, ways in person. So you visit the store uh, in a retail environment or you go on their website um, through social media, right? Whether you're on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, um, you learn about their brands that way. Of course, your billboards. So your advertising, your magazines, and then also through referrals, right? So you see someone with these really cool Nike um, tennis shoes on, okay, where'd you get these at? Oh, I got them at, I got them at Nike, great, I'm gonna go visit. So, you know, these are, these are all the different ways that you, you typically first learn about a brand and then it gets ingrained with you. Um, but these brands also have kind of describing words. You know, you think about just D Disney, um, for example, your happily ever after begins. You know, and so they've got these pictures and these images that really make you feel like um, it's going to be a really amazing, amazing experience. But as a consumer, your experience with these brands, the question was typically asked is, does it match? You know, so for, so for example, if, you know, Carmen, if you ever go through Starbucks and you have a bad experience, what does that do to that brand? That's actually happened to me before. And yes, it, the word that comes to mind is it taints the brand yeah. for me. Yeah. And I choose to go elsewhere to spend my money a different place. Exactly. Because you're assuming when you go through that drive through at Starbucks, you come up to that counter that you're going to get a good experience. You know, your coffee's going to be right. It's going to be hot and you're going to have just a good overall customer experience. So similar to personal branding, how do people first learn about you? It comes back to that first impression. It's that in-person, your physical appearance, when you send over your resume and your cover letter. Um, it's social media. And it's, it's funny because I'm having a lot of these conversations with with my children at home that are teens around that first impression, what's being put out on social media, how you can't take it down. Um, but also referrals, you know, whether you're looking for a job, you want to volunteer for a program or kind of project, it's that referral piece of, hey, you should talk to Carmen because she's great at X, Y, Z. She's attended all of our workshops. She should do an interview for you, right? It's, it's, that, it's that referral and it's how you show up you know, Tiffany shared with me that, yeah, um, you know, there's a couple women and you, one of them are, are very interactive on, on the calls, which is phenomenal. It's the way you're showing up. So we're going to take, um, if you want to take out your notebook and we're going to do a little bit of an exercise and, you know, take a look at some of these words and actions and write down maybe your top five of the words that describe you. And then you're gonna write examples of times that you actually showed that those words would describe you. So share some examples and they can be just a couple of words. I'm gonna go back to the list. So pick your top five and then write an example of how those words describe you.
And when you finish, we'll give you about another minute or two. Um, if you would, Carmen, just uh, share, share maybe one example. Okay, I'd be glad to. So one of the first ones I chose was receptive. And the thought that comes to mind for me is an example of the email was sent to me about the second helping virtual classes and workshops. Mm -hmm. And I started attending the calls. And from the first one, I realized, hey, this is not just me being kind and saying, oh, sure, I'll attend your class. We'll see if I get anything out of it. Mm -hmm. I actually began to look forward to the mm -hmm. classes, but it started out with me just being willing to yeah. be receptive. And it's opened up all new opportunities and possibilities. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. Great example. Is that it? That's it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome. So when you think about your word um, receptive, and sorry, I should have said, hang on for a second. When you think about the word receptive, Carmen, do you feel like that's a word that describes you from other people? That's a great question because I uh, honestly choose mm -hmm. how to be receptive, when to be receptive. And I'd have to be honest and say that it's not 100% because there are some emails that I get that I realize, hmm, let me think about that for a few days. That might not be the right opportunity for me. But in the same way, there are times that I will respond, whether it's by email or face to face, and let the person know that, hey, I appreciate what you're doing. That's great. I'll figure out how I can best support you. But it might not be something that I um, partner with mm -hmm. or enter into actively. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think, you know, when it goes back to when you think about those words, you know, those five words that you chose, it's the question of do people's experiences with you match those five words? Would they agree of those five words that you chose? Yeah, Carmen exhibits these five words. And that's, and that's part of the brand. It's, it goes back to the consistency, the brand consistency. And it goes back to, are you putting your best foot forward all of the time? And so we're gonna talk about some of these, you know, from your resume, from the emails that are sent out to phone calls, how you answer a phone. Um, that, that may sound crazy, but I can give you an example. There's many times I'll call a candidate for an interview and I get low, yeah. And that's my first impression. Or I'll, I'll hear screaming in the background and then they're screaming and it's like, oh, okay, they need to probably step away, right? And maybe not take the phone call at that time. Um, to physical appearance, which we're going to talk about. And then, of course, interviews and social media. Um, how you put your best foot forward as an employee and then as a friend as well. We can't forget about that one. I think of, you know, there are, there are four words that I think are really important when it comes to putting your foot forward. So we'll call it the four A's, attitude, approachability, availability, and accountability. And we're gonna talk through each of these and how you can put your best foot forward. And one of the examples that I like to use is when you think about today, with all that we have going on, Oh my gosh, we live in a crazy world right now. You know, between, between COVID, between Black Lives Matter, between all these different movements, all these different opinions, um, are you that positive person? Um, and how are you responding to what is going on? Or is this someone that you've seen maybe relationships start backing off because you're that negative Nelly, because um, you know, the way that you're showing up and dealing with some of these, and I realize it's a tough time right now and everyone's dealing with it a bit differently, but I do think I certainly learned in my own personal, um, life, 
who I'm talking to more and who I'm talking to less um, based on how they're showing up today, based on how they're being a good friend, based on how they're being a good employee. So I think the moral is it's, you know, you gotta be yourself. You know, this is not about don't be someone that you're not, but be someone that people want to hire. Um, it, it's important. You know, I think about the, the old saying of it only takes seven seconds to make a first impression. That is so true. You know, I was talking at home with my kids the other night. There was a recent high school grad that had a full ride to a college to play, play basketball. And based on what he posted on social media last week, the college rescinded his full ride scholarship. You know, and my kids were like, wait, is that fair? And, and my response was, yeah, it is fair. And here's why he represents that school. It's the same in the professional world. What does a company want to promote you based on what's, you know, what is being put out there. And so it goes back to that seven seconds. It was, it was one post that he put out there. Um, it was a certainly seen in an extremely negative light with what is going on and they don't want to, they don't want to represent this individual anymore. And so it certainly happens. And I've seen it even in the employer side, you know, as well. You know, going back to seven seconds to make a first impression, 55% of it is based on how you look and act, right? Right or wrong. Um, that's, you know, this is kind of what makes up that, that first impression. 38% is based on the sound and the tone of your voice, right? Uh, and then 7% is based on actually what, what you say, which is interesting because you would actually think, or I would think that the based on what you actually say is higher on that first impression, um, but it's not, it's actually the lowest, right? I think we know that words can, can, can hurt um, and certainly has a huge impact, but so does that, the way that you look in the sound of your voice. All right, so we're gonna go back to, we're gonna talk about those four A's. Um, we're going to start with appearance, you know, and it's, it's funny because I work with all different types of clients and I have some, you know, especially in the technology space, they are really lax. Like I'll walk into the office and they're in flip flops, they're in tank tops, they're in shorts. And then I'll walk into another client and you know, they're, they're buttoned up. I mean, they got their shirt and ties on. It's, it's very, very formal and professional. And so you know, I, I think, you know, I, I say this and we, you know, I'll give some parameters and, and some suggestions around appearance, but you really do have to know, know the company. Um, you want to look like you fit in with the company culture. Now, that, that does not mean uh, when I send over a candidate to the technology company that I'm going to recommend they wear flip flops to the interview, right? But I'm also not going to recommend they wear a four piece suit. Um, because they're not going to fit into that culture. And so there is kind of that happy, happy median. Be professional. Um, you can balance fashionable with being professional. I think that's important. Uh, you want to avoid distractions, you know, with heavy makeup, nails, accessories. Um, sense is, is certainly going to be important as well. You know, I, one tip I'll share is you know, I like to prep my candidates when they come in for an interview and tell them, you know, give them an idea of what to wear. And so if you're interviewing with a recruiter, it's acceptable to ask um, interview attire, um, you know, that way you don't show up and you, and you don't feel, um, you know, maybe adequate, adequate. I always say when in doubt, overdress versus underdress. It's, that would be, I would go with that rule. So, Ideal interview attire, um, solid color. I seriously don't see a ton of suits anymore. I see more, you know, pants with a jacket, which is definitely um, acceptable. You want to stay away from really bright colors because it takes away from you as a person. Coordinated blouse. Um, I don't recommend flip flops or any type of shoe where your shoe is where your toes are showing. Um, you, one thing I don't see a lot of anymore is briefcases and portfolios. Um, I highly recommend at least a notebook at the minimum. That way you can take some notes and it shows that, you know, you've really thought this through. 
I do recommend covering up tattoos during the interview. And I also recommend um, your makeup should be, you know, pretty, pretty clear and, and pretty natural as well. So moving into um, appearance, we'll kind of just go through these real quick. It's the handshake rule. Uh, I, I, I've had a number of clients that will call me later and they'll be like, yeah, this candidate just interviewed and they had really sweaty palms. <laughs> or they had a limp handshake. Believe it or not, hiring managers, that is something that they notice. And so you do want to have a firm handshake, but not a dead fish handshake um, as well. And you don't want to crush them where they're hurting their, you're hurting their hands. Um, you know, keep your arms open, smile and try to relax. Again, it goes back to, you know, be yourself. Let's talk about attitude. Positive attitude is really important during the interview. Um, you know, for example, one of the questions that's typically asked is, why are you looking to leave your employer? Or why did you leave your employer? You, you really want to be, you want to be honest, but at the same time, you also need to balance positivity. Um, what they're not looking for is someone that's going to dish on their old company or, or someone that's a drama queen in, in the workspace. And so, you know, you, you want to, you want to be able to be honest, but at the same time, positivity is going to be really, really important. Um, another helpful tip is know your strengths and weaknesses. So I, when I work with, I, I career coach um, clients as well. So one of the things that I, an exercise that we do is we have them go through and write out their strengths and weaknesses before they ever interview. Um, we kind of talk through them and give examples, you know, as well. The other thing that I have them do is a self-assessment. And so to talk through some of their accomplishments, um, what are they really good at? Maybe what are they not so good at? And so these are things that you can go into the interview feeling a bit, a little bit prepared so you're not caught off guard. And weaknesses, we all have them. I've had over my career when I'll ask the question, you know, what is something you need to work on? I typically, I, you know, a lot of times I'll have a candidate freeze up or sometimes I've had someone say, I don't really have any. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm not perfect. I don't know about you guys, but I'm definitely not perfect. So just be self-aware, it's important. Availability is a really big one for me. And so um, don't make it difficult to schedule a time to meet with you for an interview. Um, you need to make yourself available. If you're going to be looking for a job, you've got to make yourself available. And there is certainly a lot more flexibility around this based on what's going on and with childcare. Um, but again, you, you do need to be available. The second bullet point is probably the one that is the recruiter's biggest pet peeves. Return every phone call and email the same day. You know, don't wait three or four days for it to go by before you follow up. So this shows you're interested, you're communicating, you're responsive. It's very, very important. And then follow up, follow up, and know that balance of when not to be a pest. And I'm getting this question a lot right now. We'll talk about accountability again in terms of punctuality. And so being on time for your interview, I always recommend 15 minutes early, right? It's okay to sit in your car. It's okay to sit in the parking lot or in the waiting room, but it shows that you're excited. Um, and that way you're not sweating because you're going to be a minute late for the interview. That's not a good sign. Um, I always recommend do a dry run to check traffic and parking before you get there. And then most importantly, turn off your cell phone before you leave the parking lot. It's really important it's not ringing during the interview. Another part in, in interview preparation, um, and this kind of, again, it goes back to your personal brand, it's know your audience. And so a helpful tip here is research the organization. So go to the company website, take a look at who are they? What's their website say about them? What is their mission? What are their values? Um, try to identify what the company culture is. And, and typically you'll see culture on the website, go to Glassdoor. Glassdoor is something that you have to take with the good, the bad, and the ugly at times, but see what other people are saying and what has been their experience uh, with that organization. Re-review the, um, and familiar with the position, the job description, bring a list of questions with you for the interview, and then also research your interviewer. You know, go to LinkedIn, 
um, Google their name and just find out how long have they been with the company? What is their background as well? All right, Carmen, we are going to do an exercise. Um, before I do this though, um, Carmen, any questions before I before we get into the exercise? Anything that I say that doesn't resonate with you or you have further questions on? No questions right now. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we are gonna do an exercise. Imagine you are starting a company and you are the product and the service. What would your ads look like on a billboard? What would be shared on social media? And what would your customer service look like? Okay, do you want me to start from what's on the top of my head? Yeah, that'd be awesome. <clears throat> okay, well, the first thing that came to mind was a smile, okay? <laughs> I know oh, it's very... Yeah very simple but i can almost imagine might not be too pretty at this point but first thought um a smile and an ear because those are things that i try to bring forward at first even if i don't know the situation the smile i believe mm -hmm. allows me to be approachable and then the ear is for listening mm -hmm. and so that smile is also, my mouth isn't open. So my goal is to listen so that I understand. And let's see, what type of things would I share on social media? Hmm. Well, I would attempt to share images or phrases um, that promote maybe a, um, let's see here, a welcoming, attitude as well as a i guess customer service in some type of way i don't know what the product well you said the product is me so me as the product would be a person that's helpful approachable listening and so that's the type of thing i would try to promote on social media um let's see of all groups okay not just one type of person, especially with what we're having go on right now. I think there can be a lot of sensitivity does to whether or not the product or the company actually serves the type of person that the um, person looking at the ad sees, you know, does that company fit me? Do they serve me? Do they hear me? Do they know what I need? And then the final bullet point, what would my customer service be like? Oh, well, I would hope that it would appear like Starbucks, mm -hmm. Chick-fil-A. Uh, I would hope that it it's not quick in a bad way. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that all three of those examples are types of food service, mm -hmm. And the fa and and franchises, those particular franchises don't always reflect the heart yeah. of the company owner. So I guess I'm a little cautious about that. Good. I would want whatever service being provided to come with more authenticity. Yeah. So that's what comes to mind. Well, I love that. And, and when you first opened up, Carmen, you talked about your smile and the ear for listening. And I can hear that smile in your voice. Um, so I, I love that that's, that was the first thing that you, that you talked about. And then the words, you know, in terms of what you would, what you would share and then what customers, customer service would look like. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So we're going to do a little bit of work on the personal brand statement. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and this is something that I work also with clients on because if you're networking, or maybe you're not networking, maybe you are working and you're happy in your role, right? But you decide you want to um, volunteer for a um, project at work. And so you're going to be meeting all these new people. 
or maybe from a personal standpoint, you want to volunteer for a board or for a, you know, a, some type of project, or maybe you're in an elevator. We're going to talk about elevator speech in a minute, but you, 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 you meet someone for the very first time. And so the next two things we're going to focus on is your personal brand statement and then your elevator speech. So to begin this, there are some questions to be, to be thinking about. And so, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through a few and then I'm gonna have you take some time and reflect these questions here. So when I think of a personal brand statement, I think about the first component of that is what are you most passionate about? Like, what do you care deeply about? Okay. What are your top three or four personal attributes? The things that define and how you make things happen. And a good thing to do is to ask those that are closest to you for feedback. You know, collaborative, resourceful, flexible, forward thinking, um, risk taking, connected, ethical, genuine. Those would all be examples of personal attributes. And then what are three or four greatest strengths or top motivated skills that have benefited you in your professional world? So think about those around you and what they say about you. How do they introduce you to others? Are they someone that says, you know, um, you know, Johnny is great at identifying problems. They see the, you know, he sees the details. He leads, he delegates. Um, he's great at managing conflict. He's a great listener. He's a great communicator. Number four, what differentiates you from your competition for your next job, right? So what makes you really good at what, you, at what you do and what do you have to offer that no one else does? So your personal brand statement should become part of your online and offline career marketing. So it's at the top of your resume, it's on your LinkedIn profile, it's a career bio. This is, this is who you are and it is so important to be able to know what your personal brand is. It's, it's, it's part of that whole putting your best foot forward. It's knowing who you are and what you stand for. So let me give you a couple of minutes. Hopefully those were some good questions to get you thinking about your personal brand statement. Um, but here are some questions also to ask yourself. What do you want to accomplish at work? So when I go to work, my mission is to what three or four keywords to describe your qualities. I know I'm best when people recognize my expertise in, and then people con comment on my ability to. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to think through this. All right, Carmen, how's it going? Okay, I'm good. Uh, let's see here. I don't want to dominate 
the conversation or the time, but I have a few things if you want me to share on any of sure. these. Absolutely. Okay. So the way that you have uh, the questions formed, I'll just go down the list. Let's see. What do I want to accomplish at work? So for me, that denotes I'm working for an employer. So I'll just answer according to that. When I go to work, my mission is to accomplish the company's goals. Mm -hmm. And let's see here. What three or four keywords describe my essential qualities quickly and clearly? Problem solver, decisive, compassionate. Mm -hmm. The essence factor. I know I'm at my best when I'm facilitating the success of others. Let's see. People recognize my expertise in problem solving. People comment on my ability to connect with the needs of others. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Awesome. Good. Have you ever um, have you ever had to do a personal brand statement before? Well, I have a summary at the top of my resume, yeah. but the, honestly, the personal brand statement that's something that I'm still working really hard yeah. on yeah. because it's 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 different or new to me than the objectives that I used to work on many years ago for resumes. So this this workshop this class has is really helpful to me in that yeah well and i think too your personal brand statement may change throughout your career and throughout your lifetime as well i would challenge you a bit to think about when i go to work my mission is to so dig a little bit deeper because this almost goes back to how are you going to know that you're happy so you may be carrying out the company's goals, but what happens when those goals don't align to your goals? I don't know if that was rhetorical, but the answer <laughs> is in some way, I become unengaged or we separate. Yeah. So the further look for me would be, um, what I want to accomplish through work. Yes, I do want to accomplish a goal, but I also want to be creative and innovative and maybe come at it from a, a different angle, especially where things are right now. Yeah. I believe that we need uh, to come up with ways that, okay, we haven't done it that way before, yeah. but yeah, that's something that we really need to focus on or highlight more of what we do. Yeah. I love that. And I love when you talk about innovative and being creative and that's part of a personal brand statement. That's part of your mission of, of who you are. I love that. Okay. An elevator speech. Have you, um, have you ever had to go through an elevator speech before and, and craft one? Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, yes. then we can just skip this part. I bet you've already got it perfect. I don't know if it's perfect, but I have one that I have prepared for my interviews and yeah. the ones that I've had by phone. Yes. It's awesome. yes. You do you uh, do you mind giving it a you want to give it a um, shout out? Well, <laughs> I don't have it in front of me, All but right. <laughs> All right, no, you're fine. So we'll we'll talk through elevator speech and and here's what I um Here's what I recommend. It's funny, I'm, I'm doing some career coaching this afternoon and we're gonna talk about his elevator speech. It's, it's basically, it's a longer brand statement. It's a little bit longer. And so if you meet someone for the very first time, this is where you share who you are, what you do, and almost your why. I'm a big believer, I love Simon Sinek. He has some great podcasts out there, he has some great books, and he has a book around your why. And it's why do you do what you do it's understanding why you do what you do and then i also work with clients to understand what is their why and is there is there a match in the interview process um 
But the elevator speech, it is, it's, it's who you are, it's what you do, and it's your why, and it's getting comfortable. If you're in an elevator, if you meet someone for the first time and you have, you know, 20 seconds to say who you are, this is your tell me about yourself answer. Um, and, and you should be able to, to share it. Some do's and don'ts. Um, don't make it sound effortless. Uh, I'm sorry, do make it sound effortless and it should be very natural versus a canned speech. You should practice it. Um, you know, with a friend, with someone, you, you wanna have it strong, but not too long where you lose people. Um, and focus on how you may benefit that, that employer, employer. So here's an example. Hi, my name is Julie Weisenbach. I am a talent acquisition consultant and leader, and I'm looking for opportunities in the recruiting industry where I can lead a group of talented recruiters. I have experience with managing recruiting for the last 20 years in a variety of different industries. I'm very passionate about not only working with candidates and ensuring that they have a great candidate experience, but also working with clients to find that great match so they can grow and they can scale their organization. That's it. So it's, it's fast. It talks about who you are. It talks about what you're passionate about. I left off the enjoy piece. Um, it talks about your experience. And it's memorable. So um, I tell you what, we'll give you maybe a couple of minutes, Carmen, if you want to just take some notes, I won't ask you to repeat it back. Um, but if you want to just maybe list some, names, some, some words or keywords here, as you go back and look at your elevator speech that you've prepared. And Carmen, I will offer you if um, if you want to email me or call me with your elevator speech and rehearse it, you are more than welcome to do that. So I'll leave that open for you. Excellent. Thank You're you. Welcome. Okay, social recruiting. We're going to dig into so social recruiting. It's it's become a key part of HR teams. Um, typically, HR departments, if it's a big company, they have someone that manages their social media for them. Um, and that includes, it may be a recruiting team that does social recruiting. It may be their marketing team, they work hand in hand, but they look at information. Um, they use social networking sites to look at things like the professional online persona. So you know, and typically it's going to be LinkedIn or Facebook is what I find. So for example, I may have an interview with a candidate. I'm going to go on LinkedIn and I'm going to read more about them on their LinkedIn profile. So what does their picture look like? What does their LinkedIn profile say about them? Are they on LinkedIn? Um, same, you know, and I, I typically, I do not look at Facebook, um, but there are hiring managers I know that will go out and they will Google whoever it is they're interviewing to see what sites they're on and what is being said about them. Some organizations will say that they may choose not to hire someone based on what they have found. Now, there's all kinds of legalities around this that I won't get into today, but I think the, the whole goal is to, to understand that if you're, if you're out there in social media, it's public. Anybody can look at it, right? And it's hard to take it down once it's out there. Uh, so just know that what you have out there, you may be Google, um, and an employer may look at, at what you have out there. So um, I call this think before you post. <laughs> and you know, I won't go through all of these, but some good reasons why social media stop people from getting hired. Um, 
I would say the number one reason is around the inappropriate photographs, videos, information that's out there, right? Um, if there's anything around discriminatory comments, that may stop someone from, you know, around race, gender, religion, that may stop someone from, from wanting to um, interview them. Bad mouthing a previous company or fellow employee, I actually had that situation come up um, where uh, we had a, a candidate that had gone out and put all of these reviews out on their employer and, and it, was, it, it was embarrassing. Um, and if they're gonna do it to one employer, they're probably gonna do it to another you know, employer as well. So just some good statistics. So during the, so, during, um, the job search, do build a network before you need to. I, I tell my, my, um, my career coach individuals that you should always be networking, even if you have a job that you love, um, because it's not just about finding a job for networking, it's about managing relationships, building relationships and broadening your knowledge of other industries of what's going on and really, you know, networking helps build your personal brand. Um, do give to get. The one of the ways that I always end my networking call is how can I help you? And it's typically kind of reciprocal. It's, hey, how, what can I help you with, Julie? And then I always say, how can I help you? Because it is, it's not just one-sided. And I think those words are so powerful because it shows that you're committed to each other. Do be active online. Um, so this is not about don't be, don't be active, do be active um, and have a social presence. This is putting your, this is putting your brand out there. Um, for example, Carmen, I know you're attending a, a lot of these you know, events, which is great through Dress for Success. There's probably a whole lot of promotion that you can do for yourself from a personal brand by attending these. Um, if you just recently did an interview, toot your own horn and get it out there. That's your personal brand. That's your story. Be proud of it. Don't forget your privacy settings. Um, you know, if you choose to use Facebook and Snapchat and all those other ones, you, you, you may want to put your privacy settings on so that not everybody can look at what you're posting. Um, you know, I'm really big about not connecting with everyone. So I'm a little bit more private, um, depending on the actual social media that I choose to use. For Facebook, I'm only connecting with those that are in my close personal circle. When it comes to LinkedIn, before I accept, I do look at the individual to see if I know them or if there would be a mutual benefit. Others don't, but that's just something that's important to me. So I think to close, you know, your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. And, and this is someone, this, this was a, a saying that, um, you know, Bezos, he's founder of Amazon.com, and he's the wealthiest person. Um, as of a couple of years ago, I don't know how wealthy he is of now, but I know he's got, you know, over $125 billion. But it's important to him. And in order for him to reach his level of success, his personal brand is really, really important. And so his brand is, it is what other people say about you. It's what other people say about him as a CEO when he's not in the room. All right, so I'm gonna, I've got a couple of minutes, Carmen. Um, and Tiffany, if you have anything else to add too, I wanna leave for you know thoughts, questions that you may have. Well, thank you. Carmen, do you have anything? I know that it's kind of been a, a one-man show, but I appreciate you <laughs> participating. Thank that's you. okay. That's, like, that's, oh that's one of the benefits. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one expert consultant team, so that's excellent. <laughs> it yeah, is. That's it a is. Benefit. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm going to go back through this really carefully because you've touched on so many things that I've wanted to zero in on with you know, more of a fine-tuned focus, and one being the branding and the social media. Um, my concerns about, okay, you want to have, I want to have something out there, um, but being able to separate the personal family part and friend part 
from the professional part. That's something that I'm still trying to balance, whether it's just in my mind so that I feel confident in um, taking off some of the privacy settings so that I am prepared for employers to check out those social media links. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, I think it, it really goes down to what, what you're comfortable with. And I think it goes back to what, from a social media standpoint, what do you want out there portrayed about you? Um, I, I, will, I will give you an example. I recently um, had someone connect with me and, and she's in a similar industry that, that I'm in. And she has tied her professional and personal together. I rarely ever post anything professional on Facebook. It's typically um, more per personal. But I noticed that this woman has done that. And there are things, and she's a leader of a company, there are things that she's posting on there that I cringe. I'm like, ooh, because one minute she'll post open jobs for her organization. The next minute, there are some things on there that, yeah, they're a little bit risky, or there's some sayings or some things that she's liked or shared. And I will say, and it can tarnish, tarnish your brand. And so I think it's, I think it's being careful. Uh, like I said, I, I really choose to use Facebook as much more of a personal, that's my personal brand, but it's also a clean, because I do think about it as, Okay, if my clients were to go on and see me, what would they say? Um, from a LinkedIn standpoint, that is my professional brand. That is where I choose to write blogs, comments, um, share, again, in a very much professional manner, because it is my brand. It's who I am. I represent a company called Talent Unified, my own business, and I want to make sure that it's a positive brand out there. So I think you'll just have to really think about, first of all, what is your brain that you want to portray and which avenues. You may choose to say, okay, my professional brain is only gonna be on LinkedIn or my, and my personal brain is only gonna be on Instagram and Facebook and that's okay. Whatever you feel comfortable with. Okay, that, that's helpful and I don't want you to go over your time. So would you say that um, let's see here. How are you keeping your personal Facebook separate from your professional? Do you use a different name? Do you, um, how do you do yeah. that? Is it just in your privacy settings? No, I actually, um, we did create a Facebook page. And so and that actually just got launched, I think last week. Um, you know, I, I put in, when I, when I launched my new business, I did put a post out for my family and friends and know what I'm doing um, and that's probably the only time I would mention my company name and my personal Facebook page so I it's not something that I'll do that I'll do often where I will post content specific to my business on our talent unify Facebook page so I will keep it very separate um, from a privacy setting I personally I don't know that I've changed any settings since I joined Facebook, I think I've kind of kept them. I don't remember what I even put down, but I think it's pretty much, it is open because I am sporadic about what I post. Okay, thank you. That's helped me. I appreciate the talk and your time and answering the questions. Yeah, the information has been really excellent and I'll be using it. Well, great. Well, thank you for being a great sport. Um, I'm, I'm sure being just one person on, you're like, oh my goodness, I'm going to get put on the spot. I'm hoping that you didn't feel like you were put on the spot too much. It was a healthy exercise. Good. Good. <laughs> being put on the spot. I mean, sometimes <laughs> it's like that in real interviews. So yeah, it's good. <laughs> healthy exercise in that way. <laughs> well, that is awesome. Well, it was great to meet you, Tiffany. Thanks again. Um, for all of your help. And again, you know, Carmen, you can find me at, it's Julie W at talentunify.com. I'm on LinkedIn. I will connect with you. Uh, if you have any questions, once you've gone through, feel free to reach out. 
Cool. Thank you both so much. Yeah. I will uh, get these uploaded. I haven't uploaded last week's session to YouTube yet because I was out and I didn't want to put another thing on Liz's plate, but I will get those uploaded this week. Um, thanks again, Julie, for yeah. filling in. I greatly appreciate yeah. it. And Carmen, I'll probably talk to you tomorrow, I'm sure. Okay, and I hope you had a good vacation. <laughs> I did. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.